you fire up any movie or TV show or even commercial from the last few years, there's a good chance that it looks weird. Surreal, dreamlike, otherworldly, whatever you want to call it, this style is in. Whether it's the cartoonish geometric style of someone like Wes Anderson, or the very drifty, wide angle shots that you see in the work of cinematographer Emmanuel Lubezki. Now, this is by no means new, but creating images that feel unlike what we experience in our own lives is one of, if not the dominant style right now. I have no complaints about this. Few things get me more excited as a filmmaker than being able to create something that just doesn't look real. So in this video, I wanna share with you some simple techniques for creating some surreal, dreamlike footage of your own. Most of these are completely accessible to create on your own. You just need a camera and some creativity. So let's go shoot some weird stuff. Surreal cinematography is very frequently influenced by weather, particularly rain and fog. If you use them right, these conditions alone can make a scene look completely different. Shooting through a rainy window distorts the scene in a very like painterly way, and a thick layer of fog reduces faraway objects to their most basic geometry. It's important to know that these surreal images are often used to visually express a character's emotions, and gloomy weather like rain and fog does a great job of conveying anything from melancholy to distress. Different types of weather can do the same thing, expressing grit, survival, or maybe even peace. When it comes to focal length, you'll often hear that you should shoot most of your footage somewhere between like 24 and 50 millimeters because that range feels very normal, natural, and lifelike. If you wanna create surreal images, do the opposite, avoid that range. Ultra wide lenses distort geometry and exaggerate scale and motion so they can be used to create images that feel claustrophobic or expansive and euphoric. My personal favorites that I use all the time are my Sigma 16 to 28 f2.8, 14 millimeter f1.8, and 20 millimeter f1.4. On the other side of the spectrum, very long telephoto lenses do the opposite. They compress space and only really allow for lateral motion. So it almost makes the scene appear more like a dollhouse or a theater stage than an actual three-dimensional scene. Personally, I almost always use the Panasonic 70 to 200 f2.8, but I've also had a ton of fun in the past getting similar footage with the Sigma 85 millimeter f1.4, as well as last year using the Sigma 105 millimeter f1.4, which made some absolutely just bonkers footage. One of the reasons longer focal lengths can work for a dreamlike image is that they exaggerate depth of field by picking out one layer of depth in the scene and just throwing everything else way out of focus. A very shallow depth of field like that can feel surreal by obscuring the majority of the scene, but a very deep depth of field can also feel very off and dreamlike. Just look at the cinematography of Wong Kar Wai or a split diopter shot. Focal length can also be used just to create some fun, weird effects. One of my favorites being the long zoom where the camera just zooms way in and out of the scene rather than pushing forward or backwards. If you think about it, this is the only camera move that you will never experience with your own eyes. Like you can pan and tilt your head around and you can move through the scene, but you can't zoom. So it just feels inherently a little off and weird. Combine a zoom with a push or pull in the opposite direction, like pushing in and zooming out or pulling out and zooming in, and you get a cool effect called a dolly zoom or a vertigo effect, where the different layers of the scene grow and shrink at different rates, creating this feeling that the scene is like closing in on you. Weather and lens choice definitely make a difference, but the backbone of a surreal image is usually lighting, and that can take dozens, if not hundreds, of different forms. For example, hot spots where one subject is brightly lit and the entire rest of the scene falls into deep shadow. Volumetric light where fog or haze create beams of light in the scene, or patterns of light and shadow like those created by light coming through blinds or leaves 
or the light moving, like shooting on a moving vehicle or someone carrying a light through the scene. There are so many different ways to do this and they're all a whole lot of fun. So it's really just a matter of going out there and finding something that you find striking, something that looks different. Another layer of filmmaking that's just as fundamental as lighting is of course composition. And yet again, there are so many different ways to create a surreal image with composition. There's that cartoony Wes Anderson style we mentioned earlier where you're subframing subjects, placing a lot of emphasis on symmetry, shooting head on angles, and really emphasizing geometry. Or you could frame your subjects facing toward the edges of the frame or with a ton of negative space around them, which just feels a little bit off. One show that does this really well is Atlanta. You'll see these kinds of shots everywhere. You could also just shoot a scene from an angle that someone wouldn't usually naturally experience it, like from directly overhead, a top-down shot, from straight below, a really dramatic low angle shot, or right up in a character's face with a really wide angle lens. Lighting, composition, let's just keep going down the line of basic filmmaking fundamentals and move on to camera motion. And sounding like a broken record here, yet again, there is no one correct way to do this. Wes Anderson's movies feel a bit surreal in part because they have this very rigid camera motion, but then there's also the exact opposite end of the spectrum. People like Terrence Malick and Emmanuel Lubezki who have this very flowy, like floaty steady cam style. The camera kind of dances through the scene, floats around, and is not necessarily motivated by action within the scene. Now I think the through line between those styles that makes them feel a bit surreal is that they draw attention to the camera's motion, moving it in ways that we wouldn't naturally experience our own motion. For films that intend to feel very grounded and realistic, you'll often see camera motion that mimics the way that we would experience and move through the scene as a passive observer, maybe just following alongside a subject as they move, or the kind of quick glancing around in that documentary style shot that you see in a lot of grittier movies. If you want to create surreal dreamlike camera motion, consider going the opposite direction, asking yourself, how can I move the camera through the scene in a way that would be different from how I would see it. You can also dig a little deeper into your camera settings and create some cool dreamlike effects in camera that way. One of my favorites and one of the most obvious is a shutter drag where you're using a very slow shutter speed to create this exaggerated motion blur. I used this on a bunch of different shots in a video earlier this year about noise pollution to convey the feeling of time slowing down in a place largely insulated from outside noise. I found that the sweet spot was a shutter speed of around one sixth of a second, but you can try different shutter speeds for a more or less noticeable effect. You'll also probably have to use an ND filter to compensate for the extra light coming in with that slower shutter speed. The ones I use are from Earth and Tiffin. And before you go, I do wanna mention that we have other videos that go way deeper on a bunch of the topics that we've talked about in this video. Lens choice, lighting, camera motion, composition, camera settings. The other videos in this series go way deeper into each of those topics specifically. Before we wrap up, I do want to acknowledge editing that plays a huge role in creating a surreal scene or film. You'll notice a lot of these films have just like weird cuts in them, like cuts that aren't necessarily motivated by action or continuity, but by flow and vibe. And so many other parts of editing too, like dramatic dreamlike color grading, blur and glow effects on your footage, sound design, slowing down or delaying certain sounds, layering audio from different scenes together, adding ambient drones to your sound design. Now, you may notice a common theme here that most of these techniques work by obscuring or simplifying elements and details of the scene, allowing you to very carefully, intentionally withhold information from the viewer that they would normally expect to be there, kind of like a dream. And these techniques take on so much more meaning and become a lot more fun when you can answer the why question. Like, why are you shooting in thick fog or heavy rain? Why are you using a 10 millimeter lens for a portrait? I do like outdoorsy documentary films, which is not really a format where you expect surreal dreamlike visuals to have a place. But I've come to love this style as 
a way to show people a different side of the locations I visit and to show them how dreamy and surreal these places really can be. It's a way of showing the world the way that I see it. Surreal images have been used for centuries to convey characters' emotions, dreams, and subjectivities, and to show a viewer way more than just what's in front of them. This was a fun one. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned something new from this video. And if you did, be sure to subscribe to Adorama TV for thousands of other videos just like this one. And once again, go check out the other videos in this series for more information about the topics that we talked about kind of briefly here. Lenses, lighting, composition, camera motion, camera settings, we've got it all. So go check those out. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.